Well, here we are again, week two of Desert Springs Church not meeting together for the Lord's Day due to the coronavirus. As I wrote in a letter to the church this week, we think this is not only wise, but biblical and loving to not be meeting together under these circumstances right now. And yet, we confess freely that this is not normal. Far from it. This is a hundred-year kind of thing. It's extraordinary. And thus, it is temporary, Lord willing. Uh, We believe this too shall pass, and we don't know when, but we do know that the Lord knows, and he knows what we need and what he has for us this week. And so we want to make the most of these circumstances that God has us in, Uh, We're freshly thankful for technology, uh, to be able to text friends from a distance, but to get updates, to pray, to pray for each other, to hear prayer requests, to check in. Uh, We're thankful for what's happening here in this video service. It is a bit strange for us as a church. Uh, You can't see, but uh, in this room there are less than 10 people gathered here. And who knows on the other side of a camera, on the other side of a screen, uh, whoever you're with, uh, whoever, wherever you are seeing this, uh, we'd encourage you to not just see this, not just view this, but to engage with us and engage with our living God, uh, to sing, to pray, and to hear from his word. So let me pray and ask for his help. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your kindness to us. You have seen us through another week, and we trust you for what's ahead. Our days are numbered, our lives and souls are in your hands. And so, Lord, we pray for you to do good to us and to glorify your name, even right here now, Lord. We ask for your help, and we ask for your help, Lord, to sing truth heartily, fervently, and in faith and joy, trusting you that what we believe to be true is indeed true and true for us. We we pray, Lord, you would strengthen the weak. We pray you'd lift up the downcast. We pray, Lord, you would encourage the discouraged. We pray, Lord, you would save your people and bring us safely one day to your shores in glory. Until then, Lord, give us faith and give us worship and give us your presence, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hear from the word of the Lord from Psalm 33. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Well, as a holy nation chosen by God, the church, we serve a sovereign God who is also a good father. And he calls us to rest, to remember, and to rejoice in our father's sovereign and good plans for us. What though the way be lonely and dark the shadows fall, I know wherever it leadeth, my Father planned it all. The sun may shine tomorrow, the shadows.
this at last awaits me. Yes. My father led it all. I sing through shade and sunshine. Trust Christians, we are called to be watchful and waiting for the Lord on his promises and on his return, but we are often distracted. So let us confess together uh, that sin and others. I'll start, and then we can all respond together. Lord, we have not kept watch for you. We have occupied ourselves with our own concerns. We have not waited to find your will for us. We have not noticed the needs of the people around us. We have not acknowledged the love that has been shown to us. Let's say this together. Forgive us for our lack of watchfulness. Help us to wait to know your will. Help us to look out for the needs of others. Help us to work and watch for your coming. Teach us to number our days. Amen. Let us consider the wonder 
of Christ's first coming and long for his second. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ to condescend, took on flesh to ransom. his life. Come behold the wondrous mystery, he the perfect son of man. In his living, in his suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the truth. the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand consider his death come behold the wondrous mystery Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of Reuben sins, hangs the man in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory. Grace. Consider his coming again. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of the Psalm 63 was a psalm that King David wrote when he was uh, forced out of his home and uh, made to live in the wilderness, in the desert in Judah. He was under significant hardship, but the hardest thing for David was that he couldn't be in the Lord's sanctuary, worshiping God in his tabernacle with God's people. And so out of, out of that hardship, he writes this psalm, and it'll be the meditation for our prayer. So would you please pray with me now? O oh God, you are my God. 
earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. God, you are our God. You have made us your people and you have blessed us richly with every blessing in Jesus Christ. God, we want more of you. We want to worship you. And and we're glad that we don't have to worship you in any one place, in any certain building. Lord, you have made us worshipers that worship you in spirit and in truth, in a spiritual temple made of living bodies with access to you whenever and wherever we are. And yet, God, we know that your temple is made of living stones. Each and every saint whom you have filled with your Holy Spirit. And God, it's, it's just different not being together. And Lord, I know that there are some even today who feel this isolation and this loneliness more than others. Those who are single, those who are elderly. Yet God, we confess that we're all sad that we can't be near our brothers and sisters in this time. But God, we're grateful. We're grateful for the means that we have to still hear your word and meditate through singing and prayer. God, we're grateful for the brothers and sisters that we do get to see. And God, we pray that you would end this crisis quickly so that we can behold your power and glory corporately once again, Lord. Until then, help us to care for each other. Help us to be especially intentional in how we love one another. Lord, bless us with your nearness because we long for you as in a dry and weary land. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. God, in this time of crisis, I know so many of us are aware of the need that we have for daily provision. Lord, we even feel that provision threatened. God, please encourage us. Remind us that in Jesus we have everything that we need for life and godliness. And then no matter what hardships we face in this life, Lord, you are still risen from the dead. You will come again. You will set everything right. And nevertheless, Lord, I pray for those who are or will experience material or financial or physical need in this time. Lord, some of us have already lost hours of work. Small business owners are already losing revenue. Lord, some of us have nowhere to live. God, our Father, we believe that you feed the sparrows and you clothe the fields. Please give all of us our daily bread. Lord, and even work through extraordinary means to keep your saints provided for, even the means of the love displayed in and through your church. And God, we ask that in this time, you would show us where we have grown more attached to the things of this world than to the treasure stored up for us in heaven. Cause that to be our hope, we pray. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, You have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Lord, help us to meditate on you in our beds and in our living rooms and on our walks and in our cars and with our families. Lord, help us to meditate on you even this morning as we turn to hear from your word and help us to rejoice in God and the glory that will be revealed to us at the coming of Jesus Christ when all of our enemies, grief, fear, crying, pain, war, famine, sickness, and Lord, most of all, sin, the devil, death itself, they will all be destroyed. And in that day, we will always be with you and with one another in a better sanctuary 
Cause that to be our hope right now, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let us now meditate on him and his works in song. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. and greatly to be praised. Your greatness is unsearchable. Lord Jesus, you are the author and perfecter of our faith, and so today, afresh, we fix our eyes on you. Lord, give us a glorious vision of yourself today. We are changed by beholding you in your word, and so, Lord, as we look into your word, to behold your power and your glory and your coming again. May we fix our hope afresh in you and cling all the tighter to you for our good, for your glory. Amen. Well, we're in 1 Thessalonians 4 once again this week. 
uh, how timely, how fitting 1 Thessalonians 4 has been in these last, well, week or two with the circumstances we've had going on. Thankful for Chase and his message to us last week from chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. And now as we turn to chapter 4, verse 13 to the end, we have before us a passage which, which intersects on the themes of grief and hope. Grief and hope are in 1 Thessalonians 4. And before we read our passage, think with me about the inevitability of grief and the possibility of hope. The inevitability of grief? Well, who has the guts? Who has the gall to claim that grief hasn't touched them? Who among us hasn't been grieved? We all have. Not least in an age of coronavirus. Things that Chase just prayed for. These are strange days we're living in. How eerie of a thing to just go to the grocery store and see empty shelves. I don't know why that's unsettling to me, but it is. You think of the economic impact, which is obviously now no longer limited to a few bad days in the stock market. The positive diagnoses of coronavirus are now at about a quarter million worldwide. Over 10,000 deaths worldwide, over 200 in the U.S. But it's not just about coronavirus. We know grief long before a couple of weeks ago. We all know sickness of various kinds, financial burdens of various kinds. We, we know relational struggles. We know loss, loss of loved ones. And what shall we do with all this grief? What hope is there for our griefs? Well, think about the possibility of hope. Is there hope that can compete with our griefs? Is there a kind of hope that can even compete with our greatest of griefs? And if so, where is it? How is it had? How is it found? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us that it's found in the coming of the Lord Jesus. Let me read our passage, starting in verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Well, structurally, I think our passage breaks into three parts. There's an introduction in verse 13, a conclusion at the end in verse 18, and then we've got a body in verses 14 to 17. Or, or we could word it like this. The concerns they had, the comforts that we all share, and the encouragement that we still need. First, the concerns they had. Well, Paul had concerns. He had concerns about their concerns in Thessalonica. Remember, Timothy had been sent by Paul to go back to Thessalonica to check in on these newish Christians there to see how they were faring in the faith. And Timothy has now returned to Paul to report that on the whole, they are doing quite well. And so chapters 1 through 3 
celebrate and give thanks to God for various ways in which they're doing quite well. But apparently, Timothy also reported to Paul some ways in which this church needed, well, help or attention or filling up what is lacking, as he put it a little bit earlier. So in chapter 4 and following, you see in chapter 4, verse 1, the sexual purity apparently needed to be underscored, reiterated. The need for holiness needed to be stressed to them. In verses 9 to 12, we saw last week, love it was there, of course, but it, it needed to be encouraged, that it would grow, that it would abound, and, and that labor uh, among them would be done in love. And then verse 13 and following, this big one. Apparently, the Thessalonians were grieving about the loss of loved ones in a way that doesn't befit the hope that we have in the return of Christ. I'll say that again. The Thessalonians were grieving about the loss of loved ones in a way that didn't befit all the hope that we have in Jesus' return. So Paul states up front that some of this is apparently born out of ignorance. They were uninformed about some things. They certainly had already been taught by Paul about the return of Christ. Remember back in chapter 1 at the end, verse 9, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. Paul put the waiting for the return of Christ as part of the gospel summary of what they've come to believe and live out. But again, apparently, they misunderstood what it meant for those Christians who die before Jesus returns from heaven. You can imagine they may have asked Timothy when he was there on the ground, do those who die before Christ returns miss out on that glorious event that Paul told us about in such great detail? Do those who die before Christ returns miss out on some aspect of the, the new heaven and the new earth? We can't be sure of all the specifics of what they had been missing or misunderstood, but it's something along those lines. You can imagine them saying, we know that Jesus will return in glory. We know we're supposed to wait. We're waiting eagerly, expectantly. But for those who die before he arrives, will they miss out on that glorious experience? Will they even maybe miss out on the resurrection of their bodies? Well, you don't have to have their same theological holes or errors to understand and appreciate the reality of grief in this fallen world. Especially the grief shown for the death of a loved one. We also can appreciate, even if it's no longer true of us Christians, that there is a kind of grief common to all humanity apart from Christ, which is basically hopeless. Whatever hope is there is so, it's so small and desperate that it's basically no hope. An agnostic friend of mine in high school used to say that the most beautiful thing that she'll ever do would be to die and become fertilizer for the ground. Well, that's a sliver of hope, I suppose. Some hope that after death, there'll be nothingness. And that's not great, but it's better than hell. And some hope that the, the fun and the pleasures of this life will somehow outweigh whatever is on the other side of death. That's hopeless. And Paul insists that Christians have hope that affects how they grieve. It's not that they don't grieve. No, Christians grieve. Christians, when they have a loved one die, do indeed 
feel loss. There's a sense in which Christians grieve on a deeper level than non-Christians, perhaps, because they understand what death is, why it exists. It's because of sin. It's part of our human rebellion. It's a sentence of judgment from a holy God. That's what death is. We hate it. But in the face of the greatest of griefs, death, Christians are to grieve as those with hope, not as those without hope. Now Paul will get to the basis for that in the body of his paragraph in verses 14 to 17, but he'll give us a hint right away. In one word, in verse 13, these people are asleep. Asleep. Two other times he'll say, they're asleep. And he clearly is referring to death here. And it's not just a euphemism. He's not just being polite about the dead. No, he's hinting at what he's about to unpack in the verses that follow. Their death is not permanent. It is like sleep. It comes to an end. Which leads, secondly, to the comforts we all share. The comforts we all share. And in order to properly comfort these people about the coming of the Lord, his return, we could say, Paul takes it all the way back to the death and resurrection of Jesus in his first coming. That's the basis. So notice verse 14 For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again in his first coming, even so, you see the logic? Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him, he will raise up those who have fallen asleep. Jesus' resurrection signaled everything else to come. Jesus' resurrection wasn't merely resuscitation, like Lazarus's in John 11 or Jairus' daughter in Mark 5. Now, Jesus' resurrection was a whole new thing, a first of its kind, setting the stage for all those in him, a gift they will receive at some point when he returns. So Christ's resurrection is It's called the first fruits in 1 Corinthians 15. A kind of funny phrase for us. First fruits, well, it's the, there's a harvest and there's the first of it. And Christ is the first of it. Christ has been raised from the dead, Paul writes. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. We are part of his harvest, a harvest still to come. Now, again, don't don't miss the big picture of our passage. Paul is teaching them about the importance of the second coming and the hope that it brings to our grief. But notice how important it is for him that that be grounded in Jesus' death and resurrection. It all goes back to that momentous weekend. That's where all hope begins. And without that momentous weekend of his death and resurrection, we can never move on to hope that's still ahead. Without the cross and resurrection, well, death is still death. And death is just death. As Paul put in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they've perished. That's it. They've just perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And that's why he began that section in 1 Corinthians 15 by stating what is of utmost importance. First importance, this, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, and on the third day he was raised. This is what these Thessalonians have come to believe and put their trust in. This is what makes a Christian. You must believe that Jesus died specifically for sins and was 
raised bodily, just as the scriptures say. And if you're not a Christian, you're hearing this, and you've now heard two things that you find probably a little too fantastical. The return of Christ. That's what crazy fundamentalists believe. A second coming, the end of the world. Not only that, that Jesus was raised from the dead. Yes, it is a big ask of us to believe such amazing things. If there's no God, well, then those things are just weird to believe. It's like believing in unicorns. But if there is a God, well, this is really no big deal for this God, is it? A resurrection? A plan? The end of the world? Things coming to a consummation? Oh, there's no problem with our God for these sorts of fantastic things that we invite you to believe in today. Not just to believe that they're true, that's part of belief, but to believe and put your trust in it, to put your hope in it, to lean into it, to put all your eggs in this basket. So there's the basis for this comfort that we all share, the death and resurrection of Jesus. If we read on in verse 16 and following, we'll see the event described, this event of the Lord's return. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Oh, this drills down on all the senses. What can be seen? Well, Christ himself coming down in the clouds. What can be heard? There's a call from heaven, a summons a voice of an archangel, the sound of a trumpet. And what happens? Well, these saints are caught up. They meet the Lord in the air. This language, these images, are all used in the Old Testament to describe this end-time event. Clouds, trumpets, angels, a voice, a resurrection... God himself coming. You think of Daniel 7, which speaks of the Son of Man coming in the clouds to inherit the nations. Or Zechariah 9, verse 14, the Lord will appear over them and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth. Well, that's what Jesus was talking about in passages like Matthew 24, he predicted they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Paul uses similar language in 1 Corinthians 15, that in a moment, we don't know when, but in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at that last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. In all these passages, I believe we have the same final consummate event. It's cosmic, it's sudden, it's unmistakable, it's public, it's even visible and audible, it's universal, and it's permanent. So shall we always be with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul not only uses the language of the Old Testament and the language from Jesus' teaching, but he also uses some specific Greek language that would be reminiscent of Roman emperors arriving into one of their cities. 
And what would happen in those days is that a delegation would come out from that city to meet the emperor and then escort him into the city. That's what's happening here. Multi-layers of fulfillment and imagery. It's God showing up. It's God coming for his people. It's that final day. It'll be glorious. Now, you may be wondering about this point, about other end-time events. If you have those in your, what we call your eschatology. Eschatology means the study of, of end times or end things, last things. In some views, there are different views, you probably know. Some views of the end times have more components to them than others do. I happen personally to hold the simplest of the views, that there is one event, Christ comes back and everything all goes down at once. We're changed, there's a new heaven and a new earth, and so shall it be forever and ever. Personally, I don't believe in multiple comings of the Lord Jesus, just one at the end. And you may disagree with that, and good Christians do and can disagree with each other on some of these issues. But I just want to point out that, at least in 1 Thessalonians 4, other events that some may think are elsewhere in the Bible, are not here in this passage. 1 Thessalonians 4 is simple. It is gloriously simple because it is necessarily pastoral. Paul's point here is not just theoretical, theological education. There's a problem on the other side. There's concern. that They had some things wrong, and it was affecting their hearts. It's affecting their hope. Don't forget that pastoral concern that Paul was addressing, that these Thessalonians had been grieving the loss of loved ones in Christ in a way that didn't befit the glorious hope of Christ's return. Remember, they had wondered something along the lines of, is Jim who died now disadvantaged? Will he miss out on something in the end? And what does Paul say to that? The dead rise first. He's all about the order of things here. Speaking of two groups of people, those who died and those who are still alive. So let me read some verses again and notice the the timeline here, the sequence. This is the only sequence we find He says in verse 15, this we declare to you by the word from the Lord. Whether he got that from a passage like Matthew 24 or received it from the Lord directly, we don't know. But here it is. This is from the Lord. We who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry, with the voice of an archangel, and the sound of the trumpet And then the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. His point is that far from being disadvantaged because they've died before Jesus returns, they will in fact be privileged. They will be the first to meet him. They will be the envoy to the emperor entering the city. The dead are the privileged ones. They don't miss out on a thing. They lead the way. And do you see how comforting, how hope-filling that can be for those who find themselves grieving the loss of a loved one in Christ? They're not missing out on a thing. They get in on it before any of us on earth do. Thomas Cranmer authored the Book of Common Prayer in the 16th century, and he suggested this prayer for burials. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God, 
in his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother here departed. We therefore commit this body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus, who will change our lowly body that it may be like unto his glorious body according to the mighty working whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. It's as if every body of a saint in Christ put into the ground is a seed and a harvest is coming one day and what a harvest it will be. Saints like Moses and Abraham to perhaps your grandmother or perhaps your child. Those are seeds And the Lord will come for his fruit someday. Let's not pretend in the meantime that it isn't hard, that there isn't grief. But let's not lose sight of the grand hope, multi-layered hope. I mean, not only is it true for the Christian that dies that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Or as Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise even though his body remained there in Jerusalem that day. Not only is it true, like Paul says in Philippians 1, that to depart from this life is to be with the Lord, which is very much better. But Paul assumes all that and just skips right to the end, to that day when bodies will be reunited with our souls when saints who died will be reunited with those who were alive when Jesus returned. And most of all, we'll all be united with the Lord forever. So we will always be with the Lord. I'm struck how personal this is. Notice again, far from giving us some sort of end time sequence just to satisfy our curiosity about how it's going to go down at the end of the world, and far from giving us signs to look for to know how close we are to that coming day, no, Paul puts before us Jesus. Jesus. It's personal, it's pastoral, it's personal. Notice he doesn't even hear or talk about the place to which we'll someday go. Revelation goes there, new heaven, new earth. Revelation tells us what will change from this old earth to the new heaven, new earth. Remember that sequence of no more, no more sin, no more pain, no more tears, no more hunger, no more heat, no more labors. That's all true, but Paul doesn't talk about it here. It's just Jesus, his death and resurrection, his return, us being raised to him. And so shall we always be with the Lord. That's our hope. And this hope transcends death. This hope outweighs and outlasts the greatest Grief. Death is our greatest grief, isn't it? I mean, let's just lean into the fact that death, death's the worst. It's, it's so final, it seems. There's no undoing it. You lose this dog, you can get another dog. You lose some money in the stock market. Well, there's always next year. Maybe we'll get it back. But death is the worst. And yet if Christ's return speaks hope into our darkest and heaviest of griefs, 
then it also offers hope for every grief, every worry, every heartache that's short of death. And so there's nothing under the banner of coronavirus that we're experiencing now or can experience in days ahead that is a threat to our hope in Christ's return. Our inconveniences, our isolation and loneliness, our uncertainty and confusion, our financial hardships, sickness, and even death. Do we really think we need some other assurance than this? Jesus is coming back. Peter told us to set our hope fully on the grace that's to be revealed at the coming of Christ. Set your hope fully on this. Set your hope fully on, well, not a vaccine, though I really hope we get a vaccine soon or antibodies. Not on not getting sick, though I'm trying my best to not get sick and certainly don't want to get others sick. but we don't really need some other assurance to get us through. In fact, do we really think that we'll get some other assurance? Oh, we'll be assured, but it won't be an assurance like this. It won't be hope like this. So the concerns that they had in Thessalonica, well, they were real and they were understandable, but they were misinformed. And so the comforts that every Christian shares in who believes in the death and the resurrection of Jesus is that he is coming back and he is coming back gloriously. And if we die before he returns, well, we are advantaged, not disadvantaged. This gives great hope. And yet thirdly, there is the encouragement we still need the encouragement we still need. And so our passage ends. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Jesus has not come back yet. We're not home yet. In the meantime, we need encouragement. We need encouragement from each other about where our hope lies and what's to come. It wasn't enough for Paul to straighten out the theology Important and necessary, though that was. But he had to say to them, keep telling yourself this. Keep telling each other this. Encourage those who grieve when another saint dies. Yes, weep with those who weep. But don't just weep. Don't just stay silent. Encourage them. You can't fix them. You can't take away grief. No one should presume that. But encourage them with these words. Encourage them specifically with the return of Christ. Encourage those who grieve with any grief. Because this hope reaches all sorrows. If it covers death and the grief that we face in death, then it covers all others. Oh, how we need each other. We're reminded again that Paul is writing to a church, not just individuals, but a church. It's the church in Thessalonica. These are people who, they were around each other. They got together. They didn't neglect the meeting together, like Hebrews 10, 25 speaks of. They needed each other. They'd been loving each other. They needed to encourage each other. And yet we know that as a church right now, we're not 
together. And so we can relate to Paul on his side of the equation of what's going on in these days. We can understand his longing to see the the Thessalonians in, in some fresh ways. It's perhaps possible that we've taken for granted face to face. Desire to see you. Paul had been torn away from them. Until the Lord directs our steps back to one another and we see each other face to face more than we have than in this last week or two. Let's just do what Paul did. Let's uh, let's pick pick up pen and write. Let's pick up phones and text or call. Let's check in with each other. Let's pray for each other, like Paul prayed for the Thessalonians. With thankfulness. Let's keep putting before ourselves and before each other, whatever the hurdles, let's put before us this hope of the coming of the Lord. I encourage you with these words. One day the Lord will descend from heaven with a cry of command the voice of an archangel with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those alive, they'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will always be with the Lord. Oh Lord, uh, we stand in awe of your glorious plan and your glorious plan for us your glorious plan even now a plan Lord that well we couldn't have predicted of course it's always that way we're just now reminded afresh in these days Lord may our eyes remain on you may the hope of your coming Be a steadfast anchor for our souls. May we as a church encourage each other with these words. May we, as you give opportunity, Lord, hold out this hope to a world that so desperately needs it. Not because of potential illness or death, but because your return, Lord Jesus, might mean their doom. May it be instead their deliverance and use us how you wish. Amen. Let us respond and encourage each other with these words. Lo, he comes with clouds descending once for favored sinners slain. Thousand, thousand saints attending Hail the King who comes again Lo, He comes Lo, He comes with clouds descending Once for favored sinners slain Thousand, thousand saints
Revelation ends with the Lord Jesus predicting that he is coming quickly. And John, the writer of Revelation, responds, Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Maranatha, may that be our desire and our prayer. Well, I mentioned earlier that uh, I, I wrote a letter to the church a couple of days ago, and I just want to let you know that we have a, another, a new section on our website where all COVID-19 communication is sort of being housed. Um, there are a number of emails that have gone out to our membership and, um, and guests as well, and uh, those will go on the website. You'll be able to access them in days ahead uh, or even go back to them if you need to. And in days ahead, we plan as, uh, as elders and staff to communicate with you um, more than we normally would. Not that we have neglected communication in the past necessarily, but without meeting together like we are, without community groups doing what they do, without women's and men's Bible studies meeting together as they do weekly, uh, we want to do our best to communicate to you not only what's going on, but how to think about things, how to pray for things, ways we can encourage each other so you'll be hearing from us more in days ahead. Uh, you can go to the COVID-19 part. It's at the top. There's a banner, a red banner. Click on that, and you'll see um, anything related to what's going on these days in our plans and ministry for one another. And I, I say to you, if you're not a Christian, um, maybe you're watching this online right now, uh, I just want to invite you. If, you're, if you have questions, if you'd be willing to meet with someone, to talk with someone, about your soul, about the Lord Jesus, about his first coming, his second coming. Uh, we want to be available to you. Our, our church still has office hours currently. Um, you can feel free to email someone and we'll get in touch with you. Info at dscabq.com. We'll get you to the right person. A pastor will be glad to reach out to you and answer any questions you might have. Uh, whether over the phone or email, however you'd like. Well, I end with this benediction once again from 1 Thessalonians. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus, may, may they direct our way to you. 
And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. May it be so.